Good afternoon. Welcome back to another edition of the BNH Virtual Event Space. You are tuned in to Leica Stories. Today, we are in conversation with photographer Paul Bartholomew. Paul, thanks for joining us. Hello. It's great to have you on. How's, how's things over there on your end, Paul? I, I know we were talking earlier. You got a full day of things planned. Hopefully, we, we get you a little chilled out. We'll give a little creative, thoughtful, thought-provoking vibes before you get out there into the, the labor of the day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not you used to doing these interviews, so uh, we'll just see where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see where it goes. That's a great way to, to yeah. start this thing off. Yeah, well, we're, let's... How, how did we get here? How did how did you get into photography? Let's start there. I know you were talking a little bit about that. You had worked at a camera store. Talk to us about your your roots in photography. Well, the working at a camera store happened shortly after I decided to change majors in college because I was a, a painter and a drawler. You know, that's how I got into art school. And I had to take a photography class as a prerequisite to, to graduate. So you have to at least take one printmaking class, one photography class, or like intro. And um, the professor I had at the time was a commercial photographer, and I never even heard of that. Like, what is this? Because most people where I'm from, I'm from the Lehigh Valley. It's in like 60 miles north of Philly. You know, the idea of a photographer is somebody who does like portraits, weddings and shoots for the local paper, uh, if there is such a thing anymore. But uh, that 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 was the mindset. But, you know, seeing what he was doing on a, in a commercial sense, he was doing mostly product people. And uh, I was like, oh, this is something I could make a living doing. You know, where where, where am I going to go with the painting and drawing? Uh, I didn't know I was like uh, you know picked a major uh, something that I was really good at you know and then I just dove in without any ideas of what the future would would be you know so I would just take it one week at a time month at a time year at a time and uh, I started to assist some photographers here and there and I, I got a job at a camera store during college and I stayed there after graduating because I, I knew I would have to um, be on my own to really do what I wanted to do. Uh, you know, the, really, there, there was nobody out there hiring in-house uh, commercial photographers at the time, at least in my area. And I didn't want to have to move away. So I decided to start my business and uh, and that evolved quite a bit you know it's been 25 years this year so it 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 started off with with me doing primarily architectural photography and interior design photography um and it was really pretty much out of uh, necessity because i didn't have a studio um so with that kind of work you're going to the location and you're bringing your gear there so it was a good entry point for me but uh, over the years i started work for publications where they needed somebody who could photograph let's say a restaurant the interiors and they also wanted somebody who could shoot the food and I love food and i always uh, always had an appreciation for food photography but Earlier on, food photography was a bit stiff, you know, and feeling to it. It was like fake food. Nowadays, it's more about the real thing. Um, most of the food that I'm seeing out there is, is real. Uh, it's credible. Um, where, um, you know, 20 years ago, not so much, you know, and, and it didn't really turn me on at the time. So, you know, started to photograph for some restaurants and get more and more into it. Um, at one point, we, my wife and I started up a, a food and drink blog uh, called The Frame Table. And we had a pretty good following for a while there. Um, it was mostly to promote our photography, but it ended up being lots of people asking us how to make a recipe gluten-free or something like that. It was like, <laughs> it was a big 
was a big time suck. So it was like, this isn't bringing any attention to the photography. People love the photos, but, um, you know, they saw us more as uh, more like experts in cooking and cocktails than photography. So we kind of pulled the plug on that for, for now. Um, maybe we'll resurrect that, but, um, but do you, yeah, do you guys both cook? Yeah. Yeah. We both okay. cook and my wife is my food stylist. So, um, that's something, you know, I don't really hear many people giving stylists the credit they deserve really, because I mean, it, it, the food, when you get really close in on it, there's a difference between a restaurant preparing a, a dish and, and putting it in front of you versus what a food stylist is going to do. A food stylist knows what the camera sees as well. So they're on your team there and they get everything just, just the right balance of, you know, perfection versus some imperfections that make it look more, you know, realistic. Uh, so it's not standoffish, but um, stylist, uh, if it wasn't for, you know, my wife as, as an excellent stylist, um, a lot of my work, <laughs> my website would be rather blah. It would not, not be good. Um, I mean, I do some styling on, on my end as well. We're kind of like a creative partnership where, you know, she handles the majority of the styling. I handle the photography. And then when things are on set, we start to collaborate and, and then start thinking about moving things around, taking certain things out, exchanging things, throw the whole thing out, start all over again, but whatever. It's, it's a lot of uh, back and forth between the two of us, but um, something that I think is a great advantage is that I'm working with the same stylists over and over again, where a lot of photographers are working with many different stylists. And, you know, I've been approached by some stylists here and there, and I just don't think their style of, styling um would would match my direction of how i take things so um chemistry so not all, yeah so not all stylists are the same so there's certain styles to them as well and how they approach things so you have to find the right partner to to work with you um so uh, but it's great you know i have somebody in house we're, we're able to like jump on something last minute which often happens we'll have like an ad agency contact us with like a week's notice and we can do it if we're able to get the stuff and our schedules open so you know it, it, it's great um it, it's it's a great collaborative for sure and awesome. and my wife has an eye for photography as well so she'll you know you know give me some feedback <laughs> Throw her input in. so she so she has to have been instrumental then in in your style i mean when you look at your images and we're gonna in a little bit for those of you that haven't seen paul's work we're gonna be taking a look at some of his images it's beautiful it's cohesive you look through your website and it's like all right this is all one vision it's all you know you can have different looking dishes and whether it's food or drink everything is across the same plane where you're like, okay, this work, this work fits together. Um, was that a style that you developed in working with your wife and it just kind of be, became your style or is it something that you, did you work to build a style? How did you develop that? Um, it had to do, I had to say a lot of it has to do with the subject matter because I could show a lot more portfolios on, on, on my website and it just wouldn't work. Um, I, I found that and it was a bit chaotic for a while. There was a transition period when I switched over from doing just architectural and interior photography to, to bringing in food. Now, you bring food photography onto your website, your architect clients, or a lot of them aren't going to call you again. <laughs> 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 they for some reason the mindset is you have to be a hundred percent architectural and interior design photographer otherwise you're not a, a, a specialist and 
I had to ignore that. You know, I, I had to go, okay, things are different nowadays. There are clients out there that are going to appreciate the interior design work and, and the and the food, the architecture. I just had to, you know, wean through all this stuff that looks too commercial, too, uh, too, uh, too rendering looking. Um, and I had to be careful with what what I was showing with with the interiors and food and make sure it was you know had a similar like feel to it like interiors of kitchens okay that great that's great it goes with food <laughs> yeah so <laughs> a hospitality their hotels you know it's uh, you know it's a similar business you know where there's restaurants and and so forth so uh, i i just went by feel on the most part um uh, and uh I do have a certain way of approaching um, my photography in a way that I think does kind of keep things a little tighter as far as style as it crosses over between interior and food. Uh, there's certain focal length lenses I will only work with uh, because I just feel they go beyond what the human eye sees. And I kind of nerd out on that whole concept and did a term paper back in college on this whole thing about photography according to the human eye you know a lot of people think about 50 millimeter as being like the standard lens to start off with but something interesting uh, that and and just picking one up picking up a 50 millimeter holding up to your eye and then looking around the space and to, to me it feels a little wide it doesn't feel interesting it doesn't feel like a standard lens to me it's more like well in Leica terms it would be like a 70 millimeter would okay. be closer to to what I would feel as a standard lens as what we see so as we I'll use interior photography as an example interior photography it's almost impossible to cover these spaces with a 50 or a 70 millimeter lens it's not it's just not possible but i do feel that there's a certain cutoff lens wise uh, as we get wider uh, where things where's get that moved. line drawn 24 millimeter there's okay. simple so, so that's as wide so, as you'll go on an interior that's as wide as i try to go now unfortunately there's walls behind you you can't back up all the time so i if i have to go super wide i try to cut it off at 20 uh, but i don't feel good about myself <laughs> but <laughs> but it, it's what you have to do sometimes you know so but the goal is to always keep you know keep in mind try not to go past 24 and try to work that composition within to it don't be lazy don't just try to show everything and with my interior design style it's always been about about showing what stands out the most we're, we're not trying to document the space we're trying to interpret the space mm -hmm. and with that it may lead to taking the best you know um, shot that interprets the space but it may lead to some secondary shots to tell the rest of it in details so i would rather break up a shot for an interior into two three images than to take one big wide one that just feels like whoa it's super wide it feels like a real estate photo um so I much just more. just to say that i was going to bring up the real estate thing which is an interesting so you're breaking what a real estate photographer would go extra wide and get yeah. this almost like distorted view just to show an entire room and you're breaking that down into bite size. And I, I think interior, uh, I mean, photographers that are doing um, real estate, I mean, their job is to document the space. It's not to get too fancy. And they're trying to show everything to show more context of that other room that's going down the side or something down a hallway or something like that to tie in all the shots. It's nothing beautiful, but it has a purpose and you know there's people that work in that field of course um but m my job I, I feel is to more interpret things and to hone things down to 
the strongest aspects uh, of the space. Uh, what's the focal point and then start working my way in there, move furniture if I have to and make things flow correctly. So your eye reads it well from, let's say, left to right. Um, so I, I'm always discussing things with clients uh, with the laptop there and showing them how the eye flows. If we put too much, too many props in one area, your, your eye may just stop there. Mm. But are you seeing the design of the space or are now you looking at the props? So that's something else that we have to deal with as well. But how, how did you get to the point of knowing, did you, were you always interested in architecture or interior design? Because I think it's one thing to say, I can see a nice, nicely decorated, you know, interior and take nice photos of it. But it's another level for you to know, like, okay, this is cluttered over here. That's like a different kind of eye. So it's almost like you have to have an eye for design as well as for how the photography is going to translate the design. It it was definitely training on the job over over the years and and interior designers are uh i have to say the hardest to work with and in, in, <laughs> in my experience by far uh, they are a different breed of people and uh they will correct you if you use the wrong terms <laughs> things like that so so i kind of like uh just dug in and and uh i just enjoyed it and and I had the opportunity earlier on in my career to work for a magazine freelance, but they were using me exclusively for their home and garden section of the magazine. It was for um, a magazine that was up in the Lehigh Valley. And um, it gave me portfolio material to work with. Um, the only downside is that since it's editorial, they didn't have a budget for a stylist. So you're kind of dealing with what's there. So you kind of, if you get like one, two shots that you can add to the portfolio, it's a good day. You know, it's, it's something to build on. So when you're starting out, you have to take with what what you can get and just build on and build on and build on and build on and then the better clients come along and then you can you know step things up even more and then here you are 25 years later it's like how the heck did i get here and it's a lot of uh scratching your way through it it's it's slow but you just have to be patient um and i think the biggest thing is you have to just be true to true to yourself with what you're interested in subject matter wise, because I don't think you can be a good photographer at, let's say food, if you didn't love food. Um, and I do think it's a big advantage if you do cook um, and understand things, you know, you, you kind of know the inner workings of how the, how the that industry works. Um, and in tier design, I have an appreciation for it. Um, I would be embarrassed to have my clients come to my house uh, <laughs> because <laughs> uh, I, I would feel intimidated and um, definitely uh, can feel the weight of judgment upon me. But um, but um, there needs to be some kind of passion, some kind of love for, for your subject matter. And I... It used to be the mindset that you could only do one thing, one specialty, and that's it. Um, at least that's what was pushed on me. Um, but over the past five, ten years, I'm seeing photographers branch out into different categories, different specialties, as long as they make sense. And I enjoy that a lot because I just would be bored doing the same thing you know, day in and day out. It's nice doing a, a cocktail shoot one day and then uh, two days later be in North Jersey photographing this huge house and and working a totally different mindset. You know, I'm going from food photography, which I'm working between 50 and 90 millimeter lenses and interior design photography that I'm going from from 50 on back to 20 millimeter usually. So it's totally different world. The lighting, the direction of how you use your lighting, uh, the way you diffuse your lighting, the way you blend your lighting with the existing 
uh, ambient light that's coming through the windows with interiors where food, most of the time it's in studio and it's just flash entirely. So it, it's a nice shift back and forth. And I say for any photographer out there who's kind of like um, wondering if, if it's too much to be doing two specialties, I say if you, if, if you can do good with two, three specialties, your work shows it and people love it and you love it, just keep doing it. You, you will find a clientele that's going to need sometimes some overlapping specialties in there. And, and for me, an example would be like hotels. You yeah. know, they, they need Apple. interiors, but then they need food as well. They have a restaurant. So um, that that's an example there. Sometimes it could be food set in some kind of interior environment. Um, and vice versa. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's such a crossover there. Like I look at your work and it's like, I think like luxury travel, like that, like American Express commercial where you're just like that place. Uh, yeah, I, I would love life. getting with them. Yeah, I, I had a travel portfolio up there for a while and I should probably pop it back up there because it, to me, my travel portfolio represents my personal work and and. I was going to I was going to ask what you do for your personal work, because, I mean, we all have our professional and our personal outlet is use, usually somewhere along the lines of what we do professionally. But it allows us a little more latitude. What do, what do you do for personal work? Do you do personal projects or is it more just whatever? There, there are personal projects that I do for my commercial work. Where I want and that pushes the direction of where I want to go. Um, commercially. Okay. Um, for example, right now I'm coming up with some kind of uh, cocktail series uh, that I want to use for my next promotional piece, like postcards that we send out and emails. And I want it to be related to springtime. So that's something I'm working out right now, but I want to do it as a series this time, multi multiple pages, you know, like a folding card or something. Uh, so that's something I'm floating around. So that's on the commercial end. Um, now, that the whole idea is to attract that type of client, you know, get the better client that's going to see that and go, I need this. I want you to do this with my product. Okay. Um, then once it gets into a project and you discuss it with the client, then you find there's lots of compromise and it's not truly your pure direction, but that's commercial work. Um, with my personal work, um, I don't know. I think I just, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is travel. And um, I haven't been traveling since COVID. Uh, so um, probably won't be for a little while out of the country, but I, I do enjoy going to countries like France, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and my wife and I have similar philosophies on this. And we'll just, we set up a very loose schedule and it's usually evolved around where we're going to eat. And that's about it. So, <laughs> you know, that's we don't trip. have to go to all the touristy stuff. I, I, I want to learn about the, the food, the culture, um, and try out, you know, whatever they're, they are known for, you know, food wise. And I'll, by the time I get there, I have a pretty good idea of what the map is, you know, and I can find my way around pretty well without having to constantly be looking up if I'm lost or not. But it's, it's good to just meander off course, uh, go down back alleys if it's in a city. Um, see where you end up. Um, and, and I guess in sense, it's kind of street photography. Uh, in, I, in I was going to say, I was like, do you, <laughs> do you, do you bring like so, a wander around everyday carry camera? What do you bring when you're out traveling camera wise? Um, well, this is what changed since the, the SL system came out. I mean, be, before that, I was using uh, the Leica S system. Uh, that's their medium format camera. And that's huge. And believe it or not, I would take that on vacation with me. <laughs> it, it was heavy. Um, and then I would bring a 35 millimeter with me as well. 
Um, but before the SL, I'd have to have like a, a Nikon or something like that with me with a standard lens on for some versatility in case I needed something a low light, uh, something like that. But um, once the SL system was announced, I immediately bought um, uh, the very first SL it was just called the SL at the time and the 24 to 90 millimeter lens. And that 24 to 90 millimeter lens is the perfect lens for travel uh, for just about everything you need, um, at least for what I need. Now, if I'm in the sports and stuff, forget about it. But um, I find that like in general uh, falls within my zone of how I work uh, as far as what they have available with lenses. Um, so with travel, you know, switching over to the SL gave me something that's smaller than what I was using before. More versatility with lenses, uh, more lenses. Um, but I really didn't need the more lenses for travel with that 24 to 90. Usually, usually when I would have a 35 millimeter system, um, they would have a lens like a pro level lens that would go 24 to 70. It would be a straight 2.8. And to me, that was a pain in the butt because I'm often going up to 90. So I'd have to like switch to another lens, you know, back and forth uh, with the Leica 24 to 90. It's all right there. Yeah, it, it goes up to it does an F4 at 90. But how often am I shooting that wide open anyway? So for the way I work, it's it's perfect. And the optics are perfect. And another aspect with my personal work now is i like doing video clips of things and um an example is um was in luzerne switzerland uh, last time i was overseas and it was just starting to snow and we were at this lookout point and the church bells started to ring and i just flipped it the video and just did a pan with the church bells going because it was just an element that i could not get with just a simple still photo that that audio in there just it's one of my favorite clips just yeah, capture just, something, something and it's so it. simple you know so and this is something that i think is 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 my job at least my philosophy of what my direction is in the future as a still photographer who also can do motion is that is um my job is more to capture moments like short moments whether it's a still image or a short clip it's just to it's for a short attention span you know um and that's what clients have been calling me for so you know sometimes i could be doing a detail of a drink being poured and it's just over with within seconds and that's all they need to show on their websites to show on the the header or whatever they're they're putting it but it's meant to be down to the actual the 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 finer detailed elements uh, that like kind of the peak of of what's going on at the time you know like i like said the pouring of the drink and then topping it off with the garnish only takes the a moment few the moment of impact like you don't have to show the whole process you know and that's that that's a cocktail video but showing it finished off you know right there it gets people's attention you know that really quick clip have, um, have you found well, have you found i know we talk about it all the time that everything's going more towards video and people are now clients are asking for video and it becomes a thing of okay well if you have someone who does just stills and someone who does stills and video even if the person who does stills is maybe a little more what you were looking for as far as look or talent wise, you're going to go with the person who does the hybrid. Have you found that? Have you found a lot of your clients asking for video stuff, whether it's for social media or whatever? Um, most of my clients have approached me for the still images primarily. Um, and then they ask, okay, can you do video? And the video that they needed were, pretty much in line with what I do. I think a lot of people get a sense of what I'm about just from my website before they decide to ask me. Um, 
what else you know don't don't ask me to do a tv commercial because i don't show that on my website so that's something else if you don't like doing something and you're not comfortable with it yet don't show it on your website <laughs> so, <laughs> like like for 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 my wife and i we, we try not to show too many photos of ice cream stuff because ice cream is a pain in the butt to to style and, oh so you don't want so it's kind of one of those uh, things where it's like, i don't want people when ice people cream. when people contact us for ice cream shoots um it costs more money because it is a pain you need lots of extra materials and you have to be working with dry ice to keep everything cold it's just we don't like to do it so <laughs> so we just show a few things just to show that we can do it but um we like to you know direct people towards our our strengths mm -hmm. um and i think that's important for most photographers is that um instead of worrying about your weaknesses just double down on your strengths and that becomes part of your your branding as well uh and and then as other things start to come up you know developmental wise whether it's through your personal work and you feel more comfortable with it yeah start to incorporate it into your portfolio um but uh yeah that uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna pull some stuff up here while while you're talking paul because when you started talking about the movie and images i think we were sitting there in the office for about a half an hour going through all of these and we just we'd put it up on the screen and just stare at it and so when Paul was talking about that, that moment, it's like, and, and I did notice this. So it was great to hear you go into this is you really, it's, it's short clips. You're really just capturing the moment that matters. There's no, you know, I, I hate sitting through videos. As a matter of fact, we were talking earlier about, you know, teaching ourselves premiere and, and teaching to edit video. And it's like, when I go in and YouTube stuff, if an intro is too long, I'm on to the next. I don't want, it's like, I just come for what I, I just want to come and learn something. And that's what yeah. the kind of the vibe I got when I look at these, it was like, it really is just, it shows me exactly what I want to see. Yeah. Just get rid of the fluff, you know, and just kick it down to what it, what it should be. Yeah. Is, is there a lot of magic that, that goes in or is it pretty much what you see is what you get just really like, like a, from like a stop motion perspective? Um, magic wise. Uh, depends on what you're talking about magic um would it be like any tricks to it I mean, yeah is there a lot of post-processing that goes there and is it pretty just cut and it, dry i mean something like this it looks like it's pretty post processing is a pain because you're you're editing so many clips mm -hmm. um but yeah you, you kind of have to there's two directions to go with the stop motions you can do it in natural order where everything starts to come together into the composition mm -hmm. and that's possible when everything's nice and clean and you don't have oils on things and it's not going to create a, a smear uh, but but there's a a reverse direction you can go to where you can set up the entire composition and then things start to work their way out and then you just reverse things and then it looks like everything's going back in so like the cupcakes here this is the first shot right there with all of them together. And then we just worked our way backwards with them all working their way out. Um, so you have to have a general idea. Some of these, you just, you just go with it and see what happens. And if it doesn't look good do another one. Um, but uh, you know, there, there are some in here that uh, we, we definitely had to storyboard and and at least have some kind of idea uh, of what we were doing uh, ahead of time um, especially with our, our bacon ones that you see because th those are for a client um, this was for a popcorn client here and uh, I had no idea what to do for us so I was like let's try it out with some kernels starting off with some kernels and and then you know just bringing them in one by one like as if they're popping in place um, so I mean, I could just, I could look at it all day and I, I want to go back to, you know, we talked about, you know, when we, when we first started communicating, it was like Richard and Richard from Leica, who I would like to thank for this entire series. Richard has been great with getting us the best photographers in, in the game 
on to speak with. And, you know, it's like we talked about it, Paul. It's like when you think Leica, you think, oh, street photographer, photojournalist. Not exactly commercial. And you're out here in a long time. What is it? Like 27 years you've been shooting with the Leica system? Yeah, it's been a long time. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I admit, um, starting off in like, uh, I was using the M6 and then eventually the M7 and R9 back in the film days. Um, and they weren't always that practical for commercial, obviously. Um, for my commercial work back in film days, I was using a Hasselblad. Um, and then when digital started to come about, like I had nothing for digital yet. So I jumped in on the M system around, you know, the M9, uh, because it was full frame for the first time before that it was like half frame, I think. Um, and that was great. Uh, but it still was not a commercial camera. Um, it was more for personal and, and travel work. Um, when things became serious with Leica and blew my mind was at uh, the Javits Center, the show that they have each year in October, uh, Photo Plus. Uh, they announced, I can't remember how many years ago, it must have been about 10 years ago now, they, they announced the S system, which is their medium format system. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that I was like, I, I need to get one. Um, it, took me a while because it, it was my initial investment was like sixty thousand dollars into it uh, but um, and that only bought me like three lenses um, <laughs> but the quality of that camera is just it's mind-blowing um, it's not the most versatile um, in the world um, but uh it was the first camera I felt by Leica that I could use commercially. And I did. So I, I used that system for a good seven years, I'd say. Um, once the SL2 came out by for the SL system, um, then I sold all my S system stuff because I wanted the versatility. It, it's like, I was like, it, it's time to become more of a hybrid shooter, uh, more loose, you know, with things where I can go between studio and on location. Um, even my lighting um, changed as well. I, I bought Pro Photo lights, the battery operated ones. I can't remember the models because I'm terrible at remembering models, but but they have the ability to be used as video lights. You can change the color temperature, the intensity. They're not the most powerful in the world, but they help but then i bought aperture lighting to to help with the video end of things um so i'm able to pack up for a hybrid type type shoot rather easily because i have now i have like two sl2s and what do you what do you have those rigged up with there i see a little I see a little extra yeah. I, uh, I left them rigged up because I, I figured it would be a good conversation point. I mean, this one here from the most simplest form is I really love these um, these Arca plates that they make uh, for like a made by really right stuff. And you can buy these at B&H as well. But they also make them with an option where you can add an L bracket to it. And at first, I never bought them with the L bracket because I was totally fine with just the, the standard plate. And the plate blends in rather nicely. It's very nice and slim. Um, it's it's beautiful. Um, you know, I have to, when they come out with a new model, you have to wait a couple months before they make one. Uh, and then you can start stocking up on whatever you need. But um, they're made extremely well. Um, even down to the point where you can pop your battery out through the bottom of it. Oh, you know, wow. Nothing's in the way. You never have to take this, this bracket off. I, I bought the L bracket um, because working in the studio and working tethered, and I'll show you on this other one, um, Tether Tools makes, make sure I'm holding this up in front of the camera, right? Um, tether tools makes a um, a tether cabled clamp 
-hmm. for L brackets. So I connect this to the L bracket and then I just buy a shorter cord. That way this can stay plugged in all the time during the course of the photo shoot. And whenever, whenever I need to detach, the wear and tear happens here on this, Interesting. this part and not the camera itself. And also it keeps things steady because a lot of times if you have to take the camera off tripod and a lot of times in studio, I'm, I'm not using a tripod. Sometimes I'm doing alternative views. We'll get the primary shot and then I'll see what else I can get. Okay. I'll take the camera off the tripod in hand, hold it. And if this cord is being pulled down by weight and there's nothing so securing it, it'll cut off, you know, so, um, or bend a terminal, you know, and I don't want to send this back to, to Germany to, to get fixed, especially for how much that would be too. But, um, it's a it's a good uh, way of uh, you know protecting your camera terminal, um, but also just keeping things steady in general um, and holding down the wear and tear. Uh, but it works great. You can adjust the this bracket out as far as you you know can probably go another inch out yet. But I just leave it enough room so I can get in there with like remote cords or headphones or whatever. Um, there's a lot going on on that side, but it's, uh, it's, it's a great setup. Um, so it's, it's been working well. And they had that for the SL as well, but I think the bracket's the same for the SL2 and the SL2S. So uh, yeah, highly recommend. Um, also cages are a whole other thing to get into with, with video. Um, I just ordered one off of B and H, but it's going to going to be direct shipped. And I can't remember the name of it, but they made uh, there's a, a company that now uh, makes custom cages that are affordable, like under three hundred dollars. Um, so I, I have one on order. It could show up any moment now. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but but it was nice because it was really tight to within the. The contours of the camera where it wasn't like some kind of like generic made for a million different cameras where everything's like all spaced out and it, it looks good uh, so we'll see when that comes in uh for for working with the video stuff uh but yeah i'm constantly buying things like this and trying them out sometimes they work sometimes they don't uh, but uh, this has been working out pretty well so, yeah, yeah. It looks like a nice sleek setup. It's always confidence inspiring when everything fits just right. And you know, yeah, it, it's sleek and and I still leave the bracket on for when I'm doing my personal work because I somehow over the past few years I stopped using camera straps, which a lot of people, <laughs> a lot oh of people God. would probably freak out over it. But I just put my two fingers in here, and oh man, I'd have such helps anxiety me, for helps me helps me keep it keep it steady i do have like uh like like peak design with some nice uh straps so i have like the the wrist straps that i keep in my my case just in you know sometimes they get in the way i i, I feel that sometimes you just gotta you have the strap hanging in your hold it's just more comfortable it always seems to flop over the wrong spot at the wrong yeah. time and especially with video when i'm trying to balance it on a gimbal i need something that i can pop off entirely so most of the time by default i don't have any straps on the camera um i don't use filters on my cameras either I, if i do it's usually a polarizer or a neutral density filter for video and that's it but you're not going to see me putting like uv filters on I never put a uv filter on on like optics ever um i i just uh at like academy and this was like 20 years ago um it, someone asked a question about uv filters and it was kind of like to the point of it's not a good idea. <laughs> it, you're it'll compromise glass over really good glass. It'll it'll compromise your glass. It's like what oh, why spend like you know like seven thousand dollars on the lens and then compromise it by putting a hundred dollar uh, filter. Uh, yeah. Um but you know I, if I do I'm using like B plus W uh filters. I think they're made by Schneider. Um those have been excellent but I don't leave them on, but, but I'll leave the hoods on. Yeah. So 
I know some people it's have a thing, right but there. some people don't like hoods. I I do. Um, yes, it makes it bulkier, but you know, it's band that it's easy to just take on and off as needed. But you know, I find that just keeping the hood on there, or something bumps across the side or something, you're good. Now, if I'm going to be taking photos of like mud flying all over the place, then I might rethink the UV filter <laughs> concept. <laughs> but uh, but no, I, I'm not into that type of photography. So, uh, but uh, yeah, so that, that works out and so far so good. I think most people that use hoods now don't use it for what they should be. Like mine is literally just for protection. It doesn't matter whether it's sun, you know, sun and I'm fighting the reflection. It's like, no, it's just because I bang it into everything. Yeah, that's, that's why I have the hood on most of the time. Number one is protection most of the time. Yeah, yeah. I think it helps a little bit with the flare, uh -huh. um, but that's only occasionally. So. Totally. Well, I'm going to pull up some more images here. We're going to look at some still images because I'm going to pull up and, and start on these interiors. We saw some of the food stuff. Um, just beautiful stuff. How yeah, you... and I, I tried to share with you all images that were taken with the SL system. So since we're mostly concentrating on that. Uh, so these are rather recent ones. What is, uh, what is your interior lighting on a, on a normal shoot like this how are you normally lighting um it depends um a lot of people think that since it's inside um you don't have to worry about the sun and you really do um especially in the winter months when the sun is lower uh it could start to blast light coming in at a low angle and it can enter one end of the house and go out the other. So sometimes we have to put the fusers on the windows and get our primary shot done and then take the diffusers out, take another shot and then put them together in post. So a lot of my interior images are about two to three images um, put together. Um, this one here I think is only two and that's just because uh, the exposure towards the windows may have been too too hot so i needed to bring it down another stop um but could i have extracted that info from one file sure but i just don't like the feel of it um i i'd rather take multiple shots and then bring in what details i need exposure wise um based on their optimal setting um, so like a base exposure would be a majority of what you're seeing here down the middle. Um, and I'm probably using only one strobe. That's it. And it's nice and it's, balanced. Yeah. If it's a white, if it's more like a white interior, like the walls, the ceiling, um, a lot of times I'm just bouncing off of a ceiling or off of a wall but it has to be at the right position a lot of times it's like coming from the position between the camera and the window the main window light um kind of it kind of helps transitions the tones because i still like to see the shadow end of things i don't like to blast out the shadows shadows are important yeah. you know shadows you didn't have a light source in the first place so it's but it does matter where those shadows do drop. And for interior photos, you want your your shadows dropping away from you so they so they look smaller. Um, but uh, the camera does great because you're looking at the you know looking at the cabinets and it has a nice creaminess to it, uh, nice subtle tones, um, and the saturation that that was pretty much up to me in post, you know, how far I wanted to go with it. Um, how much depth are you normally shooting with? Uh, depth of field. Um, interior design, I'm usually always on F11. Um, okay. I don't like going smaller than that uh, because the optical quality starts to deteriorate um, with the fraction. Um, I start to notice the fall off as soon as I take it from F11 and take it to F16, I can see a difference immediately. The sweet spot tends to be F8, F11, 
Um, sometimes I can push it further. I noticed the Leica lenses, um, you can push more um, than, let's say, a Nikon or a Canon uh, lens as far as taking it to f16. But um, most of the time it's f11. I just have to find that sweet spot where everything comes in focus. And sometimes I may have a, a back end of the photo may start to fall out of focus. But, um, you know, it's a part of a way we see, um, you know, it's kind of like atmospheric perspective, whereas things dwindle off into the background that become softer. Um, so th there's nothing wrong with that. As long as I'm getting the prime zone um, in, in proper focus, that's what matters. How does that change with uh, food as far as settings are concerned? Um, food, I go more shallow with the depth of field. Um, not unless the client requires much more in focus. Um, if I have to do that, I'll still only max out at F11 to get the most out of it. But um, I'm starting to play around more with focus stacking. Uh, so I'll take different exposures based on the focus points and then put them together uh, in Photoshop. And I know there's plugins for it, but I, it's been working for me in Photoshop. So, you know. If it works, why why fix it? Yeah, so it, it it's it's pretty neat how how it works. But um, I prefer to get the shot in 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 one shot, and I'm okay with out of focus areas on food um, because it's more humanistic. You know, when you're looking at something, you're not seeing everything in focus. Your brain puts it together that way um, that everything's in focus by memory, but when you're actually looking at something, you're only looking at one point of that object at a time. Um, the background's out of focus. You just don't realize it, you know, or the back end of that glass is out of focus. You just don't realize it. Um, so I just find the sweet spot for the focus and how the depth of field works out and uh, let things fall, fall from there. I mean, the nice thing with studio work is I can pick my prime aperture and then I'll set the, my lighting uh, to match that. Um, where natural light, you, you have to um, be working with the shutter speed, you know, to, to help with that, you know, to, to help match things up better. And that's not always, uh, you know, something good. <laughs> there's such an incredible balance you talked earlier about you know the necess the necessity for shadows you know we we need that we, you know if we don't have shadows we don't have as much contrast and contrast i think is you know that, that depth. It, i think this goes into more of you know back to a previous question about my personal work and if it was up to me photographing like the the produce shot that you just showed uh, before that falls into my personal style okay. um, i like things to feel like they're window lit and i like the dark shadows i like the in and out of details the um, directional light uh, it's just so much more interesting um, well, that's what i that's why i asked you about the lighting because everything looks does look window lit it looks natural yeah, and, and it's such restraint and and this one actually I think was window lit, uh, but we just controlled it a little bit. Um, but this type of lighting just shows off the textures of the feud um, much better. Um, it also pops the colors rather well. Um, see, some if this was for a commercial shoot, the client would probably say, "Oh, I don't see that table between those, you know, the potatoes and the." And the, the pears, I can't see the detail of the table down there. It's like, my point is, why do you need to see that? But but they want to see it, you know, they want a more clean yes. look. So a lot of times in advertising, we're seeing things shot on higher key surfaces so you can make things out better. It's more simplified in that way. Um, dark surfaces don't always go over well. Uh, when I propose them, um, it's usually on a white or or more neutral gray type type setting. Um, so that's like kind of like an industry standard that you see across the board. 
Yeah. Um, at, at least uh, for for the clients I've been working with, um, they they like it clean and easy to 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 digest mentally. Um, yeah, they're they're using and, they, and it's kind of a safe approach too. Uh, let's face it. I mean, they're using these images not just on their website, but they're using them at trade shows and blowing them up huge and using them on social media. Um, and they may alter them themselves, but um, most of these clients were, were pulling out the the lighter surfaces and at least we're trying to push them towards surfaces that are textured uh, and opposed to like seamless, which would be just, I, I want to touch upon that, but, um, <laughs> but as long as it's showing something like wood grain or some kind of personality in it, okay. Um, and you have to listen to the client and, and what they had in mind because it's their branding, not my branding. Um, it's not, it's not really my image, you know, it's, it's me creating their image. So you have to, um, you know, work with it. Um, even though you may think you can do better, um, it would be useless for the client. Um, so good luck getting that client back. Yeah. (laughs) If if you just decide to go rogue and (laughs) do it your way. Uh, but, um, but yeah, that, that's the whole thing in commercial, uh, you know, work in general, um, you're always going to have the client and oftentimes their client, you know, to communicate with. And sometimes you get to talk to them at the same time. Sometimes it's like you contact one and then they contact the other saying, Hey, does this look good? Can we move on? And then they say, well, move this, switch this out or something, you know, or it could be fine with one person and not the other. So you have to make everybody happy, you know, so um, it, it's not walking just about what you want. It's not just necessarily about you having experience in it. At the end of the day, you still have to incorporate their yeah, vision. And, and it, it is a lot harder than doing personal work for sure, because you have to have a commercial mindset and, and you have to uh, have the ability to um not just communicate with with your client but you have to be very patient too because sometimes you you feel like just screaming your head off <laughs> just because some of the times the requests are just like it's just not possible in the world of photography to do you know technically sometimes or or styling wise it's like you know like they don't understand photography like you do like your wife does where you guys understand it both so you can work together but then you'll have a client who doesn't understand what the the boundaries are as far as what you can create yeah i, I mean you know for example it could be how much could be in focus on a cocktail when you're shooting straight down on it. Like they may want to show the bottle next to it and they want to see everything in focus from the top of the bottom bottle all the way down to the surface. Like like it's a rendering. And, and that's like massive depth of field. That's just not possible that, that close, you know? So you kind of have to like, okay, we can do focus stagging up to a certain extent or something like that. But it's like, do you really want it to look like that though? I mean, my website doesn't show that. So, and I am very purposeful in the fact that I don't show that because I don't want to attract the, this you know, conception that this is photography and this is what I do. Put out there um, what you want to attract. Yeah. And once again, it goes back to that. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the compromise factor, um, it, it involves a lot of education, um, talking to the client and, and using, picking your words wisely. Um, so the client comes back again, you know, so, um, and we have some clients now that we've been through many shoots with them and went through all the nitpicking and we now know what they like and what they don't like we know if they're going to like the spoon this close to the plate or further away or um 
the the arrangement on the plate or something like that but we we know their preferences for the colors the the composition uh, whether they went overhead or a three-quarter down shot um after so long the the client then saves time by not being at the shoot they go okay just shoot it yourself and uh we'll look at the gallery next week and everything's fine and uh, after a while you can create a nice trusting relationship with a client because you're you're, you're on the same page finally uh, you know what they like you know their preferences and uh you know we have a handful of clients like that um and it, it it's really nice because we, we do like um we do like it when a client gives us a project and just says, go, go do it, you know, and, and see, you know, we'll look at the photos in a week or yeah. two and, and we don't have to have the client there, you know, looking over our shoulders because we can work faster if it's just, you know, the stylist and, and I, um, instead of having to do chit chat with the client and, stuff like that if we do have a question though with a client we'll just send off a text with a photo say hey is this what you want or get on a zoom call um everybody's different you know some i find clients with the shortest attention spans or the best ones just send a text um we do have clients where we'll have a send a text saying hey the um the dropbox gallery is updated here's your new photo um what do you think and then we'll pop them up, you know, up on Zoom and share the screen showing the, the capture, you know, the camera view over overhead or whatever. And then they can say, well, can you knock that uh, spoon two inches to the right or something? You know, so then we can nitpick if we want to. So some clients are like that. Actually, we did a shoot last week like that um, where it was like we had the Zoom, you know, ready to go at all times. And then when we're ready to change the set out, we'll just log off, get everything ready, set up the next shot, have the camera ready with the view, get them back on Zoom, we'll text them, everybody's back on, and then they go look at it and talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. And then it was like, okay, well, if we move it here and there, and, and Andrea will be there, you know, on the set, they're moving things and the director which way to go and stuff <laughs> turn that radish 90 degrees so i the the zoom call um when the client wants to be thoroughly involved remotely um does take up a lot more time so i suggest any photographer doing that um method to uh be either prepared for very long days um or book in there an extra half day uh for the next day uh for anything that overruns because clients can be maybe used to uh, you know a traditional photo shoot while they're in studio and be expecting a a certain amount of images but um once they're away, you know, you have to get their attention first, wait for everybody to get on call, you have to wait for that. And then there's somebody who's caught in a meeting and it could be 20 minutes uh, before everybody's giving you your opinion on something. And hopefully the food didn't go bad by then. So <laughs> that's, that's the other factor. So, um, yeah, it, cocktails are the worst uh, when it comes to um, doing shoots remotely because a lot of times we have ice. And we've been starting to use fake ice more and more. Uh, I think it's Trend Grove Studio. So they make good ice. Um, it's super expensive. I do have some problems with it, though, because it's too clear. And there are little micro bubbles that tend to adhere to the, to the acrylic ice. Uh, if you get too close in a shot, you're going to see... Uh little bubbles stuck to the ice it's like some it kind of way it has some kind of like static or something that just pulls it in so some drinks it works great if there's more color to the drink if it's more closer to clear drinking you're backlighting it it shows out the bubbles more 
Um, I have nerded out on making my own clear ice from like real ice. So I have clear ice molds that I can make all different kinds of ice uh, shapes and all that stuff. Um, I can even make a big chunk of ice um, in a cooler uh, where it freezes downward and it pushes all the impurities out and then I pop it out right while it's still water at the bottom and then you get this nice big clear piece of ice and then I can chisel it out to whatever I want. I can make shards, you name it. Um, the clear ice is nice because it will always have a, a slight hint of imperfection. Mm -hmm. And those imperfections in the ice actually help diffuse light. It, it changes the light passing through the glass where, where acrylic ice is just right through and it looks too clean. But I, I like the light kind of having a little bit of a stoppage there on the ice and doing something else, adding a little bit more glow to it. Um, seeing a little texture in there is interesting too. Um, so, and clear ice has good hang time. Um, it's still not going to last 10 minutes, 20 minutes for the client to get on the call. So we have to make sure to <laughs> hey, get on the call. We're pouring this right now. We're snapping the shot. We need to move real quick. If you want the garnish move two centimeters or something like that. And that's often like just a little nip with a tweezers or something. Um, it, it, it's something else. Uh, some of, so many things are on the micro level uh, while doing the cocktails for sure. Um, but I, I think I enjoy it the most. Uh, for sure. Um, but yeah, when the client's on set, it goes quick. You know, the you know, client can look through our prop collection. We have a prop room um, here and uh, people can pick through all our glassware and, you know, different colors in order to match up the surfaces, uh, you know, so, so then the client can see things that we're not showing them on screen. They can just get nosy and start going through things. Um, it's nice. Um, and another thing is our studio is not set up like a traditional studio. Our studio is at home. So our entire first floor of our house is studio space. So, so a client can go off to a private call in the parlor or hang out in the living room, go outside on our deck during the summer and, and chill out with some fresh air. Um, yeah, so it, it, it the idea is to make things feel more um, comfortable. And when I'm comfortable, I can be creative. Um, where if I have to rent a studio for a day or two in New York, you know, a drive there is, you know, that's stress right there. And I'm, I'm in an unfamiliar space. Um, I like to bring my own gear because I don't like to rent because it's not my gear. I don't know how it was handled before. I'm not as familiar with it. Um, I like I like my my home environment. I, I like my my familiar familiarity with with things. Um, it, it, it just makes me feel much more at ease and more productive, um, you know, than, than being somewhere else, um, which I just wouldn't be able to stand. Plus, plus it's a more of a home setting, so. Yeah. Not like a studio in some kind of industrial building, you know, something like that. Um, it's meant to feel homely. So it, it, it's been working out really well, especially since the pandemic. I think people are, are more open uh, with the mindset uh, of getting out of the city. Mm. Before it was really difficult to get people out of the city. Uh, now I have clients that come up from Maryland um for seafood photo shoots and uh you know they'll drive all the way up from 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 baltimore and uh the, you know the the one client she'll bring her husband along because he'll go kayaking at the lake the so it's like yeah it's like you know they tie it in with their weekend or something like that so it's a beautiful area i live in i'm that's the reason why i moved here uh not just because it's very beautiful i'm in bucks county pennsylvania so wow. i'm I'm literally like five minutes from the Delaware River. There's tons of things to do just on the river. But no, I also cover bridges. <laughs> yeah, cover bridges. I have, oh man, I have about 
three within five minutes of my house, covered bridges. So in the fall, I'll just go out there and take some photos just for myself. But awesome. I mean, it, it's beautiful here. I take it for granted because I live in this environment. So when I first moved here, I was taking lots of photos, you know, lots of personal things going for walks and stuff. And now it's like I drive by this stuff and crossing cover bridges every week. And it's like, this is the normal. This is the Every day thing. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, this area uh, that I live in, it, a lot of, we have a lot of neighbors that are formerly from New York. Um, I even have a neighbor next door who um, owned a grocery store and uh, I think it was in Brooklyn uh, for a while too. And they would go back and forth every day uh, from here because it's it's not bad of a drive from Bucks County. I mean, we're in the upper portion of Bucks County. So we're actually more considered uh, New York Metro than Philadelphia, uh, even though we're in the same state and we're closer to, to Philadelphia. Um, Philadelphia, it's just hard to get into because you have to go like southeast and then southwest and then west or whatever. You have to go all the, there's no straight way yeah. to get to Philadelphia. It's over and, and, and the traffic and just the Philly people don't like to let you into traffic. It's a different <laughs> mindset there in general. Philly people... Uh, I'm not going to make people happy, but they're just <laughs> mean people. Uh, I lived in the Philly area for 10 years and it's, a, I, I had to get my, myself out, <laughs> but <laughs> New York, you know, people, you know, take turns merging and stuff and, you know, it's congested, but it, but it moves, yeah. it, you know, things move. And for me to get to New York, um, I can get the B and H in an hour and a half from here. So that's not bad. You know, I hop on I-78 and it's straight drive out. Um, getting into Philly could take anywhere between an hour and a half and two and a half hours. So it that's there's a big unpredictability factor. But I mean, the nice thing about being here is that I'm central to to both New York and Philly. So I'm able to get to wherever I need to. I, I you know, I, I'm I'm in the game for two two different markets here. Um, and That's now I'm trying to bring people here if I can. Um, and, 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 and we have been, we have a lot of New York clients that we brought to the studio. Um, I think that once people see what we're about, um, and what kind of environment we're working in here mm -hmm. and when they arrive here, it's not going to be like chaos, you know? good luck finding parking and all that stuff no i have a, I have a, I have a it's drive a, it's a relaxed <laughs> atmosphere all the way around and i think i mean just just the work itself and we did drop the paul's website there so definitely check that out bartholomewstudio.com but look paul it was this was great i'm a huge fan of your work like i said our our whole team was geeking out over over your stuff it's just amazing work and i think this was great because we, you know, we had talked about it before how with Leica, you, you never think commercial, you don't think food photography, you don't think interior. And it's great to expand the bounds of what we normally associate with a particular type of photographer, a particular brand. And uh, I mean, what better system to showcase the elegance of your work than, than the Leica system. So Paul, I want to send a huge thank you to you for taking time out of your day. I know you got a lot to to do oh, it time, time to go back to the yard work there yeah, right i look forward to getting outside it's nice out so <laughs> well, we'll let you go get to that a huge thank you to you and uh of course a huge thank you to Leica for sponsoring today's event and uh we did drop the information for the sl2 and sl2s prime or vario bundle there so you guys can check paul's workout check the bundle out and maybe look at an sl2 or sl2s for yourself so, Paul, huge thank you to you. We'll let you get going now. And a huge thank you to our viewers as well for tuning in. But that is it. This has been another rendition of the Be Nature Virtual Event Space. Catch you all next time.